Hiring for your small business? If you're not looking for professionals on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. That's like looking for your car keys in a fish tank. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job but might be open to the perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't even visit other leading job sites. So start looking in the right place. With LinkedIn, you can hire professionals like a professional. Post your free job on linkedin.com slash qualify today. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Easy Conversations podcast, a podcast about having easy conversations. This podcast is in partnership with Evergreen Podcasts. And every week, we dive into the topics of mental health, adversity, spirituality, and societal issues. I'm your host, Furkan Dandia. This week's episode, I welcome Mark Wiseman, a self-proclaimed shaman with ancestral roots in the ancient Norse and Celtic traditions. We explore Mark's profound spiritual journey from ordaining as a Christian minister to embracing a shamanistic path influenced by his Norse heritage. Mark discusses overcoming societal programming to find spiritual and mental freedom. He shares insights on shamanism, integrating spirituality into everyday life, and the significance of small incremental steps in personal transformation. Mark also emphasizes the need for a compassionate understanding of different spiritual perspectives and the hope at the core of human existence. Additionally, Mark promotes his show Whispers of the Norse on Ethereal TV and his weekday morning affirmations on YouTube. Please check out all the ways you can find Mark online. And before we jump into the episode today, here's a brief word for the sponsors. Are you trying to improve your daily routine and mental health? Look no further because Easy Conversations is now an affiliate of Mental, the app. Mental will guide you through your day with everything you need. I have emphasized on this podcast how my morning routine has been monumental for my mental health and mood. Mental provides you with a step-by-step approach to building the routine you need as your mind's personal trainer. From their morning two-minute masterclass delivered by a comedian to a cold shower protocol from a Navy SEAL, Mental has you covered. Mental also provides focus support and help with falling asleep. Get your daily routine all jam-packed in one app. Listeners of this podcast can now get a one-week trial for Mental by going to getmental.com slash easy. Don't wait and start building the routine you need. Mark, welcome to the Easy Conversations podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm really looking forward to our conversation and hearing about your journey. I know we've chatted briefly offline and... I didn't really get a full flavor of the story, so I'm looking forward to getting all of it today. But before we jump into it, I do want to give you an opportunity to share with the listeners a little bit about yourself, where you're based, what it is that you do, and what's brought you here. That That is a very long journey. But let me tell you, firstly and foremost, my name is Mark Weisman, and I am a self-proclaimed shaman, of course, only because I don't fit into any other category. My belief system stem from my ancestors, the ancient Norse, and certainly the Celts of Europe. That's really where my beliefs kind of stem from. However, in college, in, in life, I discovered the connection between a spirituality, our spiritual beliefs, and our spiritual understandings and the general psychology Mm -hmm. and of modern humans. And I began to make that connection. And of course, during college, I became ordained as a minister in the Christian church. Mm -hmm. Uh, That led me on a a discovery uh, of working primarily with my brothers and sisters returning from combat, experiencing a level of symptoms, um, uh, traumatic events that occurred to them in conflict. And as we worked through them, I discovered, of course, more about me and more about my spiritual understandings. And it was during that time that I became connected, if you will, with my my ancestors. 
uh, my ancestors, of course, being of the Norse descent. That led me on a further explanation or a further exploration of my journey and my understandings. And one of the things that came to me once I left the Christian church in a quest to discover what my true spiritual beliefs were was a freedom to understand not only one view, but all the views. Mm -hmm. And it became a much bigger, much less burdensome way of living and way of understanding our lives and the, the journey that we all make. And that exploration and that understanding um, has led me to where I am here today. Today, I offer uh, many uh, individuals, uh, I would say, a, an, an ear. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I rent my ear um, yeah. for, for uh, times so that they can begin to see outside of their programming Mm -hmm. of what what really is affecting them and then work at it not from a superficial i got to meet a a societal need kind of way but from a foundation of yeah. who i am why i am and what changes me from that perspective then and only then can we have a true relief within the mind eliminating anxiety, eliminating depression, eliminating all of those things that modern day life, unfortunately, has a tendency to do to us. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you for sharing all that. And one of the things that jumps out, because you, you talked about a self being a self proclaimed shaman, but what does that mean? Like, what is a shaman in your view? Because we tend to hear that more now. And, and one of the things we tend to hear about at least in the the Amazon forest, shamans are providing guidance and insight on some plant based medicine. But to me, the way I view it is, is shaman is someone who has just that insight, right, and who can guide you. But what are your like? Well, what makes well, you a self proclaimed shaman? Yeah, really, a shaman it is all of those things. But more importantly, shaman and shamanism in general mm -hmm. is when an individual is called by spirits. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not called by meeting some criteria. There's no bar. There's no measurement. There's no test that you can mm -hmm. take or class that you can attend that's going to make you a shaman. Shamans are called by the spirits to do what they do. Shamans are conduits. Mm -hmm. We typically take what we're given from the spiritual realm and we pass it along to those on the physical realm. Mm -hmm. And then in many cases, because many people don't understand the breath and certainly the understandings that exist in the spiritual realm, many times shamans are, are a necessity to help explain and to explore how to take this knowledge that you've now been given and apply it to your life. And so that's really, as I've looked at uh, my life and what's transposed there, that's really what I've, that's the me in a nutshell, mm -hmm. is that I was not a spiritual person at all. as luck would no, i don't know if luck is involved but yeah. as life would have it i had ventured down when i was a younger man i had ventured down a very dark path that wound up in a drug overdose in 1989 it left me <clears throat> really completely lost because yeah. i had no idea at that point and then at literally seven months, almost to the day later, I met and married my shield maiden, whom we've now been married 30, almost 34 years now. It took, it wasn't one of those lightning strikes that says, oh, you're now called. Yeah. 
kind of thing. It that's not how. It's certainly not how it happened for me. It was a, um, a, a transitional, constant transitional for many years, as I determined what the voices were, who I was, what I was communicating, what I was feeling, and all of these things drove me to recognize myself as a conduit for the spiritual entities. And that's, yeah. uh, people started referring to me in this way once I left the Christian church and I just, okay, that works for me. Yeah. And that's where I'm at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. And to me, what I'm really, how I interpret that is, is you have this deeper intuition. You're able to draw a lot of wisdom. Now, a lot of the times people don't really understand that. So when you say calling, like, what does that mean? Right? Like, what does that mean for someone who's trying to understand what, what are you hearing? What are the messages what, you're getting, right? And that's a tough one to explain because yeah. a, a lot of it comes down to what am I feeling? Mm -hmm. And from what am I feeling, what do those feelings, what do they do to me? What mm -hmm. physiological pieces come into play when I feel this way? Mm -hmm. And when you begin to uh, certainly during meditation and time of intrinsic reflection, you're going to get overwhelmed, I think, yeah. uh, to some point of feeling as if not that you're missing something, but that there's something to gain, that there's something to learn. And there's this constant quest to, oh, OK, how can I learn this? What can I learn here? What what can I know? What parts am I missing? It's that drive that I think is commonly referred to as a call. Mm -hmm. It's just, there's a real desire to learn about something, whatever that mm -hmm. is. Yeah. For those people who come to any sort of spiritual guidance and say, oh, I have the answers and here are the answers they're purely kidding themselves. Mm -hmm. We are all just travelers together. I can yeah. tell you simply what's worked in my 58 years of living. And the honesty that I can bring you is to say, not all of my 58 years has been this glowy, white robed uh, lifestyle that everyone's going to envy. No, quite the contrary my first 25 years or so, 20, 20 some years were a nightmare. They were honestly the other end of the spectrum that I want to be on. But it was those experiences then that allows me to understand where I am today. It, and it allows me to help other people who are still back at that other place and say, hey, guys, this is what it took for me to move forward. And so that's the word that I spread, is that there is hope. There's always hope. Hope is an eternal flame that burns within us. We can surrender it, but we can't kill it. So it's just a matter of rekindling that fire, if that's what's necessary, and getting back after it. Yeah, for sure. And Hope is something I've really reflected on over the last few weeks, especially. So it's almost synchronistic that you bring it up, but it's been powerful because there is that, again, with hope, it requires, it, it kind of, it's along the lines of faith, right? It requires this suspension where you, it's, you're relying on this surrendering, right? And accepting that, okay, I don't have all the answers, but I'm going to surrender to whatever's coming up and lean into it. And, and that's something you're touching on. So what shifted for you? Because you you know you mentioned that you're telling people, this is what it took for me. Was it that overdose that you alluded to earlier? What was that turning point in your life that allowed you to shift and then start leaning into the work you're doing now, and changing you, course? You know, I, I wish I could. I wish I could point a finger. Yeah. I wish I could say, 
oh, it was that moment or it was this yeah. other moment. But I think it's been a culmination mm -hmm. of so many micro steps that yeah. I, it, they weren't even perceptible at the time that they were happening. Mm -hmm. But now you look back, you know, that you get the hindsight and you're able to review and you go, holy monkeys, look what mm -hmm. I've done and look how I've accomplished and look what I've learned and what I now know. But I don't think there was, for me, I started uh, ministry. Ugh, I hate that word, but um, I started working with people um, when I was ordained in 2001. Mm -hmm. And I started as a chaplain for the, the Christian church. And even at that time, when I had become ordained and I had done all the studies and I had uh, accomplished some bar set by somebody I had no idea mm. and became a minister. I, and I, I preached peace and love and harmony and those things, those general terms. Yeah. Even then there were missing parts in, mm -hmm. in my heart. There was just parts that, and obviously, as I would find out later, parts that Christianity could never fill mm -hmm. because uh, it wasn't until I left the church and it was about, that was 2008, nine, nine, 2009, when and I left the church and began to really study all practices. I was studying the laws of Islam. I was studying Judaism, Confucianism. I studied many different understandings mm -hmm. until I started feeling that I needed to know my ancestors. Mm -hmm. Now, this is out of the blue. And I was like, I don't understand, but okay, I'll do some amateur genealogy here and start figuring out what come to find out my ancestry went pretty far back yeah go on to develop ultimately 53 generations 54 generations to wow. to find my great grandfather whom began a process when i would meditate I would go into a trance. I would meditate very deeply. I would think about my ancestors and I would focus on them. I would try to picture what they looked like, what they would say, what they would think of me. And I, I was constantly thinking about this when one night, and I want to say it was like in 2011, 2012, sometime in there where I, I woke up from my meditation, I got out of meditation and realized that there had been a page written mm -hmm. on a piece of paper in front of me. And the piece of paper was written in such a way that it struck me insanely stupid momentarily mm -hmm. because not only was it written in runes, which at that point I did, I had no idea what runes were other than, than just a Germanic alphabet. I had no idea of the power of the runes, but just as importantly, it was written in Danish, hmm. a very old mod, uh, style of Danish. And so it took me, I would say probably a month to translate the document from first from Danish to English or from runes to Danish to Danish to English until I got the message. And the message was that we're all listening. What are you saying? Mm -hmm. And I began, and that's when I really began in earnest to use more trances, to do more meditation, more concentrated meditation, began to have more of these events where I was receiving information and literally handwritten notes by my hand that I don't remember writing that told me that 
here were some ideas, here were some thoughts and some knowledge and intellect, and I began to accumulate them. And now, as of this, as of today, I think I have four books, just handwritten notes that I have received during these trances that now I can work with, that, that mm -hmm. gives me some context to understand life and, and yeah. certainly this universe. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I do agree with you when, when you say it's, it's not one moment that you can pinpoint because when I look at back, back at my journey, it's almost like I can watch this movie playing back, right? Where it was like these, to your point, these micro movements, just stacking one on top of the other and then creating this experience to where I was like, Oh, okay. I understand now. Exactly and, and, right. And um, yeah. so many people discount those small, imperceptible steps, mm -hmm. but they're required to be at where you're going to be. Yeah. It's all part and parcel. It's part of the trip. It's part of the journey. So, yeah, yeah. It, and you're exactly right. You look back and you go, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I appreciate you sharing some of the experiences you've had as well. Now, one of the things I do want to ask you is because, you know, even in terms of receiving a lot of these insights, as you've shared, when someone from the outside isn't able to understand, they'll dismiss it as, okay, this guy's losing his mind. He's crazy. And I can appreciate when you're on that spiritual path, you don't really care people are saying, right? Because you've found this deeper sense of connection and acceptance within yourself. But still, as a human, you know, or as a, a spiritual being going through the human experience, what do you, how do you kind of look at that when people dismiss it? And, and what level of compassion then do you have? I think I, I have all the compassion in the world. Yeah. And it's only, I always alert people to our journey downstairs for a midnight snack. Yeah. And life is like that. Life is dark. Life is unknown. Of course, when we speak of dark energy and we speak of the darkness in all of existence, we're speaking of the unilluminated or uneducated or un, uh, unknowing yet. And it is only by us being there with a flashlight and able to navigate through until we can find a light switch, right? <laughs> and, and we can actually get to, at least to the refrigerator door, because we know when we open the refrigerator, of course, it's going to have a light on it. My point is, is much like that in life, and this is what I always tell people, is that mm -hmm. you need to be willing to pick up your flashlight. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, pull up a pillow and blanket because it's nighttime. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's not until you begin to, to see around you that you, you have one of two real paths. And this is the struggle that everyone meets is that you are either a going to become more devout in what you do believe, whatever that is, whether you subscribe to monotheism, polytheism, whatever, right? You're going to understand why you believe that mm -hmm. and things are going to click or you're going to begin to question it. Either way, you're going to grow from it. And that it was the best part of my life is as I educate people, as I illuminate them, hopefully they begin their journey of one of those two paths. They're either yeah. going to become more devout. They're going to study. They're going to break it down and, and get into the micro steps so that they understand exactly. And there's no arguments in their mind. Right. Because we always have to remember that spirituality is all about our perspective. We can all stand around and look at the same mountain, but we're going to see it differently. We're yes. going to see it differently because we're standing in different places. We're looking at different angles. We're going to see it differently. Spirituality is that mountain. Mm -hmm. And our spiritual beliefs is the person next to you who's looking at the same mountain, 
are, are they wrong? No, of course not. No. They're seeing the mountain from their angle, yeah. from their perspective. And of course, you can drill it down into the emotional filters and the chemistry and all of that and get into this really philosophical discussion as to seeing the mountain differently. But realistically, just by being standing next to me, your angle is a micro difference. Mm -hmm. You're different. And you're not wrong. You're not any more right. We're the same. We're looking at the same thing. So when we think about our spiritual beliefs, whether you believe there's one God or you're changing your perspective and say, oh, there's multiple deities, whether you change it again and say, eh, I'm not really into the deities thing, but I get the spirits. Yeah. It matters not. We're all looking at the same thing from a different angle. No one's wrong. No one's right. Spirituality is big enough for all these different perspectives. And yet there's still more. There's still room. Right. We still got room for other perspectives and on and so forth for infinity. I think that's probably the biggest message I would say that I give to people is that who are critical of beliefs that are outside the norm Yeah, is that it's a different perspective. If you're buying a car, you don't stare at the door and expect the whole car to be perfect, do you? No, of course not. You walk around the car, you check the tire, you check the engine, right? You're going to look through the interior and you're going to make sure it's got features and come. Same thing should apply for the things in your life that are important. And spirituality is a cornerstone to who you are. So you would think you'd want to check it out completely <laughs> yeah. uh, before buying. Yeah. So that's the analogy I like using. One of my favorite that I got in a very early trance that really shocked me into my current understanding of it was breaking the whole idea of spirituality down into a puddle mm -hmm. and, and being able to look at the puddle. And of course, because my Norse ancestry, there was nine people around the puddle. And as they all looked at the puddle, they saw the reflection of the sky above them in the puddle. Mm -hmm. They could all see it a little differently. Mm -hmm. They would see different cloud formations. They may see a bird fly through. They're going to see different. And as we move around the puddle, we're gaining more of a perspective of the entirety of the puddle. Mm -hmm. But our, our true gift, our true desire, hope, is that we can turn to the person in our, on our left or on our right and say, what do you see in the puddle? and gain their perspective. Now you're drawing in their experiences that can augment or help you with your own. Mm -hmm. And so um, it allows us to grow as a spiritual being. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I totally appreciate that and get it. And I think one of the things I've come to appreciate also and realize is often we're so attached to our perspectives or majority of the times we're insecure about them that when we feel challenged we tend to get upset and uh you know for me when i'm confident about something it's easier for me to be okay to accept other people's views and also open myself up to being challenged because i'm like okay maybe i can learn something new it's only when i'm really attached and insecure about my own views that i get threatened and, and get upset at other people. And, and that's significant too, right? To realize right. it. And then you can have that compassion again for, for right. individuals. And that's really where you can break it down into something that you do, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people get uncomfortable when speaking about their spiritual beliefs. And so when we take it out of that context and we put it into the context of a new car, <laughs> you know, you're buying a new car on the lot. The new car is spirituality. And what are you going to do when you're buying that new car? You're going to check it out, right? You're going mm -hmm. to look at all the data. You're going to check the mileage. You're going to, you're going to do all of the, hopefully, you're going to do all your homework before yeah. you, you make a major investment in a, in a car. The same thing applies. And so I find that when, and that's one of the, the gifts that 
my ancestors have given me is being able to take it out of the spiritual, take it out of that uncomfortable conversation and bring it into a, what would you do in your home when you had this situation? Okay, let's walk through that. And you can step them through that and it applies. And then you say to them, okay, you just evaluated your spirituality. Great job. Yeah. And of course, then it dawns on them that, oh yeah, you're right. You're, you're exactly yeah. right. You don't have to subscribe to what I believe. Matter of fact, I prefer you don't. I prefer that you believe what you believe, but just yeah. believe it and don't, don't do it because grandma, grandpa, whoever said so, believe it mm. because it, it makes sense in your heart and your mind and it feels right. Those are the keys. And if you can gain comfort from your spirituality, you're in the right place. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things with respect to attachment is labeling things. And I know when you and I chatted about labeling of deities. So why is that something that you take interest in? And what's your view on all of that? Labels, labels I think, it, if I could point out a single fact that has caused more division throughout mm. the, the generations that have studied, particularly monotheism, but it's nowhere doesn't have a corner on the market by any stretch. Right. Is this idea of labels. And what labels mean is labels is a human thing. And we need it to reference something is that we can't say that thing over there. No, that would be horrible. We have to say that fence over there, the brown fence. So we have to get into all this description. And those are labels that we're applying to convey a message. The problem is so many people get hung up on the brown fence. They forget that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about dividing yards, not the brown fence. And so then we get the, the arguments. No, it's not brown. It's really dark red. And we get into all the, and we spend more time arguing about the color of the fence than we do for the purpose of the fence mm -hmm. or, or the, the reason around it. And so uh, the, the problem with labels is they're many times they're applied incorrectly and out of context, mm -hmm. right? So we'll use a phrase, my favorite one, my favorite bad one. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that, that flies here. Well, my favorite is the word heathen. I, I'm, I've been referred to a heathen on a multitude of occasions, of which I promptly correct people. I am not a heathen. A heathen is a gardener. Yeah. I'm not a heathen. Yeah. I, you don't want to see me in a garden. Bad things happen. I don't take care very well of the creator's creations with these thumbs. <laughs> he, he, heathen is a phrase that <clears throat> was originally intended to... Uh, it comes from the same thing that your hearth comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all gardeners, right? <clears throat> but the church grabbed a hold of it and began to mean people who were not like us. Mm -hmm. So heathens and barbarians were close, <laughs> mm -hmm. according to the civilized world of the Roman yeah. Empire and beyond. And But everybody hung on to that. And they it began to be applied outside of the context at which it was originally intended. Mm -hmm. And now people use it just off the cuff and they don't even know what it means. Mm -hmm. The other one that, that pushes my buttons, <laughs> I only have two buttons. The other one that pushes my buttons is pagan. Another mm -hmm. pagan means villager. Yeah. Has nothing to do with, Anything other than your cultural beliefs. Mm -hmm. Why are we applying it to our spiritual beliefs? Mm -hmm. I don't know. So, again, as long as labels that are problematic only because we then begin to argue about right. the word, we put too much value on the word and mm -hmm. forget 
about everything around it. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think one of the things I've reflected on quite a bit is the whole metaphysical, metaphysical aspect of putting ourselves in a box and limiting our own understanding and potential when it comes to everything. And that's kind of what you see with labels as well, is this limitation when we put ourselves in a box and we try to define everything within that box. So right. I definitely see that happening as well. And it's, yeah. Now, it's I do want to worldwide. shift the conversation a little bit Every and understand your experience as far as you mentioned being is it in the my church phone or is it you? and some of the work you were doing I there. See you because frozen. there's an aspect of with the church at least what I've come to understand from personal story. experience too is it becomes political and there's a purpose that the church serves in my case and my faith system, it's the mosque and it's a, pur it's a purpose that it serves. But hmm. what affected me personally was the political side of it. And then people are you still there for coming to the need for power or greed. And that takes away from that spiritual nope. sense. Oh, there we are. Now you're back. Yeah. Okay. So, so my question, I wanted to ask you a question around your experience with the church and, you know, shifting away from it a little bit as well, because in my experience, what I've come to realize and, and what in my faith system is this Islam. So mosques for me, at least that often the political stuff gets in the way and there's greed and the need for power and that whole idea and what the church and mosque or synagogue or temple, what they're trying to serve is that community aspect, that spiritual connection, but that goes away when you get people involved. And I see a lot of people that have religious trauma too, where they associate the, the faith system with the people that are in charge. And that, to me, becomes a problem for a lot of people because they're not able to differentiate between those things. That's so great. what was it like for you being a part of the church system and then shifting away from it and then kind of doing the work you're doing now? Well, I think one of the biggest things was the definition. Firstly, let me define what I discovered mm -hmm. as a definition, if you will, of religion. Mm -hmm. And religion has a sliver of spirituality followed, connected with a large section mm -hmm. of practice. If in religious teachings, practice, and the practice, of course, includes words like thou shall, thou will, do this, do that, do this other thing. The spiritual side simply says, here's the information. Here is the love. Here is the forgiveness here is the path there's no there's no thou shalt do anything mm -hmm. so whenever you slide into and, and certainly um, most most religious practices have this section of group of people mm -hmm. who are more interested in the practice than they are in the spiritual side, mm. leaving supposedly leaving the spiritual side to the the leadership of the church. Mm. Right. the The downside with that is that the individual partakers of the knowledge are not going anywhere. Mm. They're not growing. They're not learning. They're not loving. They're just following blindly, if you will. Mm. And so as I know as I ventured through the church, there was, there were so many issues I had with the doctrine because mm -hmm. <laughs> the problem with most religion is that the doctrine doesn't match the ideology. Okay. So there's a separation right there. And the problem with that is that there's only so far you can go by asking the questions, mm -hmm. right? What do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? What do you mean by this? You, you can only go so far and then they're going to go, mm -hmm. right? The downside is to that 
theory and that line of thinking is that unfortunately that's where many people just stop mm -hmm. and they say oh okay there's no answer to that so we'll call that faith that's not faith that's the easy way out mm -hmm. right we have to learn we have to grow we have to go beyond what the spiritual leaders are telling us we have to go beyond that we have to have our own relationship with the spiritual realm and how that's going to work in our lives every day. And we have to have that conversation. And so I know I struggled, like I say, I struggled very deeply with many parts of the doctrine, particularly as it separated further and further from the, the ideology or the, not even the perceived, but the original, if you go back to the original documents, you can, get the gist of their ideology but by the time it was written into the holy texts it had already been manipulated and the the doctrine had already pulled away from the ideology yeah. and so you're technically you're you're just preaching someone else's behavior modification that has no bearing on your spiritual growth on your spiritual path the other thing and i just want to clarify uh, something you said a little earlier and i just want to clarify a lot of people think that the spiritual journeys that we go on are this other path of life yeah. that we say oh we're done being human we're going to go be spiritual and the the, the two are not mutually exclusive right. you can't have a spiritual journey unless you have a physical life you they're part and parcel you get them both and you never stop being either yes so if you go and you become a mountaintop guru with all the answers from the spiritual realm this beacon of knowledge and wisdom you're still human yes you still have to go to the bathroom. You still have to sleep. You still have to eat. Yes, you may alter your diet quite a bit, and that's great. But nonetheless, there are some basic requirements. You have to breathe. You're still human. Yes. And most importantly, you are still going to feel. Mm -hmm. You still have feelings, regardless how spiritual you are. Matter of fact, the more spiritual you are, typically the more emotional journeys that you have i think a lot of people get confused and they think oh this week i'm going to go become a, a shaman and i got to go on this spiritual journey and i'm going to leave everything behind and no you're not mm -hmm. you have however many years of living stuffed up here it's not going right. anywhere you're not going to forget it you're going on to a better different path Right. And, and so they're not mutually exclusive. And I always try to make sure people understand that because, yes, being spiritual means taking the garbage out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it means washing the dishes. It means everyday life. Mm -hmm. They're not. And I think people tend, and this really uh, feeds into the monotheistic practices that I've studied anyway, where many people are Sunday morning quarterbacks, okay. right? They, they go and they show up and they do the routine and they do the whatevers. They may show up for a function during the week, but for the most part, they're there on every Sunday. Mm. And it's, yeah, get the touch on the forehead and I can leave kind of thing. When in fact, your spiritual life is going on all the time, 24-7, yep. 365, from the day you draw air to the day you stop. Yep. It is always there. And I think a lot of people get confused about mm -hmm. that. And that sometimes, because they say, much like I said, when I overdosed on heroin, that's the most nasty of all drugs, mm -hmm. I think, in my experience. And I was like, how can I be redeemed for this? Mm -hmm. How can I ever hope 
to find redemption. Mm -hmm. There is no redemption. Mm -hmm. There is, I learned a lesson that I'm never going to do that again. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to allow other people to do it again. Mm -hmm. Or in the first place, I'm going to do everything I can to stop people from doing yeah. that. And that's, is that redemption? Or is that just me saying, hey, I learned that lesson. Move on. Yeah. You know? And uh, so one of the things that I, I had somebody ask me one time is like, well, what qualifies you to be a shaman? How can you be a shaman? And I'm like, you could be a shaman. Right. Who knows? <laughs> the, we don't know who the spiritual entities are going to call upon. I was not looking for this. Right. I, I was not in the market for a spiritual uh, connection at all. Mm -hmm. Yet the spirits found me and they began to communicate with me. And now I've loved every second of it. Mm. Yeah. There's something I do want to touch on. You mentioned, and it's important because I find a lot of people to your point, because they want to go on this spiritual path, they want to run away from the worldly things. And it's that thing that, you know, we've talked about, you and I've talked about too how to be in this world without being of it. And life is a struggle. The human aspect is a struggle. It's not something you can run away from. You can't just avoid the distractions the material world offers. And in my faith, that's the biggest thing I've taken from it is we're in this world for the struggle. And there's a the beautiful thing I've understood about my faith is we typically have a call for prayer and typically after that call for prayer, you, you pray it soon after. But when we're born, we have that call for prayer whispered into our ear. And when we die, there's a prayer for us. So that from the day you're born till the day you die is a full circle. And right. that is the struggle. That's your right. whole spiritual journey. And right. that, when I think about that's just so powerful because to your point, it is a 24-7, 365 days a year struggle. And we can't just yep. go once a week and say that I've checked this box and I'm done now. Yeah. And that's exactly right. It, it, but when we begin, and I think that's part of the enlightenment that happens mm -hmm. as we go through our journeys and we go through our paths, when we begin to understand that, yes, it is all the time. You're never away from your spiritual gifts. You're never away from your spiritual ancestors. You're always connected. I believe it gives us a amount of freedom. The freedom of the mind. In that no longer are we having to meet these societal bars. I know in my life, one of the things that really happened once I left the church and I really, I found my way back to the Norse Celtic mm -hmm. understandings and beliefs is I felt relieved, mm -hmm. a huge sense of relief that I, I didn't have to meet bars. I didn't have to come up to some standard. I didn't have to do things a certain way and wear certain clothes and meet with certain people. I could just be me. Mm -hmm. And that was enough. I, I didn't need to be anyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, I get asked all the time and people see me and I'm out riding on my Harley and they'll be like, you don't act like a shaman. Yeah. You're right. I'm not acting. Yeah. I'm not an actor. Yeah. I, I'm just me. Right. It, it, but it really gave me that freedom that said, wait a minute. Why am I jumping through all these crazy hoops right. and doing all these crazy things when I can just be me? Yeah. I don't have to wear a mask. I don't have to pretend to be something or be happy when I'm not. I can just mm -hmm. be me. Right. And that, that really gave me, I, I think, uh, of all the gifts I got, intellect and, and all things aside, there the biggest gift I think was that freedom of the mind mm -hmm. that allowed me to just 
relax, right. just unwind, get rid of that stuff. Now I still stress about, am I going to have enough gas to make it to the gas station? Cause I forgot to fill up my truck. And then once I make it to the gas station and I put gas in the truck, that goes away. Yeah. I don't have to worry about, I'm going to get out of the truck here and there's people watching. I have to act a certain way because I'm a this or that or this other thing. Yeah. No, it's just, you begin to live your life, I think, more congruently mm -hmm. and more authentically. Absolutely. And that, that really gives just a massive freedom in the mind. Mm -hmm. I think we talked about the labels and that's the idea when people are like, oh, you're not acting this way. What does that mean? I'm just being. That's it. Yeah. It's that simple. Just be, <laughs> right? Yeah. There's the... There's no adjective yeah. here. Yeah, F exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> and and one of the things I do want to finish off with is just understanding you've made reference to your ancestral background and, and the Celtic kind of background there. How have you then been able to understand some of that ancestral trauma as well? And is that something you had to work through as well from a generational perspective? And how has that been part of your journey? And what have you come to understand from all of that? Great question. I don't know that I am, I'm, that obviously there's generational trauma yeah. that happens and I can either absorb that or not. In my life, I have chosen, I'm not there fighting. Yeah. I'm not there doing the tasks. Yeah. I'm not going to accept responsibility or blame or credit or anything else that I didn't earn. Mm -hmm. If I, screw something up, by all means, I'll, I'll take that yeah. hit. I don't think, as I've dealt now with many ancestors of mine and, and others, I don't know that's one of the things that's passed. Mm -hmm. I, I've done a lot of reading, particularly about my family and my history and, and their lives and their accomplishments and Sometimes they're not so accomplishments and I've read it and I think I absorb the understanding of what they were trying to do. And, but it leaves out the fact that there were people traumatized mm -hmm. by all means that I can sugarcoat it three ways to Sunday, but my ancestors were Danes and Danes were not the happiest people on the North sea. They were not known to be the outside of their own tribe. They were not known to be the greatest people ever. But that didn't make them wrong. And that doesn't make them bad. It made them, we have to put it in context for their time. And what worked back then doesn't work now. Obviously, I can't go Viking today. I can't even imagine the stack of laws that would be involved in that. But that was appropriate for their time. And so I think we have to always, whenever we speak of trauma and how generations are going to pass that down, we have to remember the context of the framework that we humans have built mm -hmm. called time. Mm -hmm. And we have to put things in their appropriate time right. and say, that was not wrong in that time. Mm. By our standards, looking back at it today, oh yeah, that's bad. Mm. Yeah, no, we can't do that. Yeah. But in that time, in that place, yeah, that was what worked. Right. And that's what they did. And so I, I don't think that there's a trauma uh, to be associated there. Okay. Yeah. And I, I don't think that goes for anybody because you can find generational trauma in any belief, any belief, pick one. The monotheistic practices all have them. Polytheistic practices have them, particularly the large society in Mesopotamia, the Mayans, the, the Aztecs, the Romans. Pick a culture. And there, there were parts that were eh, eh, a little sketchy, yeah. but ultimately in their time, that's what worked. Yeah. 
And I think we have the, and, we have, we can just have that sna snapshot in time to look back on and we have the benefit or the luxury of hindsight. So it's easy to question some of those things when looking at it from our view. But like you said earlier, we're just looking at the mountain from a different angle. <laughs> so that's brings us back full circle. But Mark, thank you so much for this conversation. I really enjoyed it and learned so much from you. Is there anything else you would like to add that we didn't touch on? I know we covered a lot of ground, but yeah, I just want to <laughs> give you an opportunity if there's anything you would like to add beyond what we talked about. The greatest thing that you can, everyone can pass on is there is hope. Mm -hmm. at, at the very core of all of existence, there is hope. And for those who are struggling and need to speak or need to see a little more. I'm going to pitch, if I may, I'd like to pitch my show, which is a 30 minute show that's available for streaming. It's on etherealtv.net. You can stream them. There's a whole bunch of episodes up there right now. You sign up for a little subscription fee. I don't remember what the subscription fee is, but you sign up and there's tons of shows on Ethereal about many different topics, many different perspectives. This goes back to what we were talking about before about perspectives and just having so many views, mm -hmm. which is wonderful, which is why I'm so pleased to be a part of Ethereal. So the show Whispers of the Norse is available on Ethereal. You can download it at will, just become a subscriber and me and 9,500 other shows, uh, you can download what you need. In addition, every morning, every weekday morning at 6.55, give or take, Alaska time, I do a morning affirmation, just get the spiritual juices rolling. That show is available on YouTube. You can join me, like I say, every weekday morning, 6.55, Alaska time. And we just cover some basic ideas and some hope for a better day today than yesterday. And we're always just trying to make that one step better. And so you can always go to our webpage, which is the center of our universe. And that's NorseWhispers.com. Norse, of course, being as in the Viking guys, Norse Whispers, as in a whisper, and .com. NorseWhispers.com is the center of our universe so you can find all the things about our media you can ask questions you can find out some history about the Uthatnar, and certainly my journey is all there you can visit that site so shameless plugs there that i'll gladly put in the biggest thing i i hope to convey is learn to listen with our hearts and learn to listen through hope yep because when we do those two things, we realize that humanity is all in this together. And all we can do is help each other or hurt each other. And it's just better to help. Yes, absolutely. No, and I appreciate you sharing those plugs. I would have asked you anyway. So no worries at all. <laughs> okay. we'll definitely put that in <laughs> okay. the show note captions. But thank you so much, Mark, for your time today. It was a great conversation. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you for following up with us. I realized that we moved this out of the day, so I'm glad we were able to connect and uh, and get the word out. Yes. Because, again, that's the important part is getting the word out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you for checking out this episode with Mark. As always, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. That's the best and easiest way to support this podcast. And on Apple and Spotify, you can leave up to a five-star review. Please check out the sponsors in the description and also evergreenpodcast.com for their network of podcasts, including Easy Conversations. And finally, please subscribe to the Easy Reflections newsletter, a zero-cost newsletter that goes out once a week where I summarize these podcast episodes and talk about different mental health topics I'm reflecting on. Thank you again, and until next time.